Hello there and welcome to part two of the CPT Explained series. So in the first episode we defined each of the cognitive functions and I highly recommend you keep that video open in your browser to be used in conjunction with this one. Because in this episode here things are going to get a little bit more complicated. You see CPT doesn't focus on functions as these kind of isolated processing units but rather on the interplay between all of the cognitive functions in order to make up the entirety of any given cognitive type. And so first and foremost, in this video, we're going to be exploring the lens codec relationships. These are essentially functions that operate in pairs alongside each other. And this relationship is pretty much compulsory. You see, each of these functions rely on each other in order to actually formulate what you are experiencing. It's practically impossible to have one of these functions operating without the other. And for those of you more acquainted with classic MBTI terminology, think of a codec function as a judging function, and a lens function as a perceiving function. And the notion of the lens and codec in their relationship, their reliance upon each other, actually goes all the way back to the words of Carl Jung on his exploration of the dichotomy of irrational versus rational. And I know what you're thinking when you hear the word irrational. If a function is irrational, it must be somehow inferior or even more chaotic. And yeah, okay, maybe there's an element of truth to that last part, but there's actually a good reason for Carl Jung describing these functions as irrational. It's not because they are bad functions or necessarily even chaotic. It's just because they are doing naught but perceiving information. If a function's sole agenda is just to perceive raw data, then it is by nature irrational because it is not assigning rationale. And this is where the codec function comes in. You see, the codec function is not perceiving any information. It very much relies upon the lens function, that irrational function I talked about before, essentially feeding information to it. And with that information being scooped up, that raw data from either the external or internal world, it can begin to assign values upon it. And so whenever you are thinking about cognitive functions within CPT, always keep in mind that all important interplay between the lens and the codec because they're completely redundant without the other. And just a quick example here, when I'm looking at this camera lens, I'm not actually assessing the details. I'm not even looking past the camera lens into the room. Rather, my lens at the moment is directed much more internally, with my experience of the external world being much more unconscious. Because in order to present this largely ad-libbed dialogue to you, I need to be perceiving my internal world locking on to those relevant areas and then forming values upon that perception. Those values equate to vocabulary and the meaning contained in that vocabulary and then I'm transmitting that to you through the skill set of dialogue. But before we dive into the main part of this video that is exploring each of the respective lens codec pairings, there's one additional piece of information I need to impart. And this is how one codec lens pairing, let's say, extroverted intuition and extroverted thinking can actually be completely different from another pair of the exact same functions. And for a suitable analogy to explain this, let's dive into the cockpit of a plane. You have the pilot and you have the co-pilot. The pilot is in charge of the throttle, in charge of the steering mechanisms, whereas the co-pilot is performing a much more auxiliary role. And as such, an ENFP, for example, will have extroverted intuition in a dominant position with the auxiliary function of extroverted thinking performing the role of the co-pilot. Whereas an ESTJ, exactly the same functions in this particular codec lens duo, but extroverted thinking here is in the lead, with extroverted intuition being the auxiliary to the dominant function. So without further ado, let's start visiting these codec lens pairings, starting first with extroverted sensing and extroverted thinking. So extroverted sensing here is the pilot, that means the central agenda is more experiential in nature, with the rational function, the codec function of extroverted thinking, performing an auxiliary role as the co-pilot in this analogy. So this individual is locking onto a very specific portion of reality, experiencing it very intensely, but also assigning objective value to it. Variables here tend to be more static than they are dynamic, so, you know, instead of trying to juggle multiple things together, trying to encompass all perceived reality into a single kind of cohesive narrative, this individual is rather focusing on a specific objective, on a specific value. Which is kind of ironic if you think about it, because many extroverted sensing definitions kind of refer to someone bouncing off the walls, jumping from one thing to another. And in some ways this can be true, especially in the case of an extroverted sensing dominant, but when they do so, they are locking onto one thing and then locking on to the other. 
They're not trying to do a thousand different things at once. If they are doing that, they're dipping down into extroverted intuition and I'll be going much more into how that is possible in a later installment in this series. But let us say the order of this relationship is now reversed with extroverted thinking performing the lead role as the pilot and extroverted sensing as the auxiliary, as the co-pilot to the dominant function. Well, the focus here is transitioned from experiential, as in the former case, to rationalistic. The individual is focusing probably for a lot longer on any specific thing until that thing has been brought into order. And as such, the conversion to auxiliary lens function here tends to have a more discerning nature because it is staying locked on until the rationalistic agenda of the dominant function is being complete. And as such, extroverted thinking, extroverted sensing tends to lock onto something specific and see it through until completion. But what if the codec here was instead extroverted feeling? Well, let's now take extroverted sensing and extroverted feeling. Here you have, again, an experiential agenda with extroverted sensing in the pilot seat. But rather than being supplemented by extroverted thinking, it is now being supplemented by extroverted feeling and therefore much more concerned with the social order, with the social result, than it is necessarily the objective result. But here the auxiliary of extroverted feeling is serving an experiential agenda and therefore it is not being used for its own sake, but rather to enrich the concrete extroverted sensing experience. And as such, extroverted feeling in this instance can take on a much more playful demeanor, as it is being used in order to supplement the experience of the dominant function. However, if the order of these functions were reversed, with extroverted feeling being the dominant, and extroverted sensing now supplementing the dominant extroverted feeling agenda in auxiliary position, well, you have an individual much more concerned with social order for its own sake, with extroverted sensing locking onto a specific variable, a specific value, until that value has been brought into extroverted feeling alignment. And as such, extroverted sensing here tends to lock onto a specific value until the extroverted feeling objective has been accomplished, with the dominant agenda being much more oriented towards social order, experiential novelty takes second place. And you know, at this point in the video, it's fair to be asking whether or not an ESFP can use extroverted feeling, whether or not an ENFJ can use extroverted thinking, and I'll say to that, yes, quite a lot actually. But I'll be visiting that in much more depth, you know, the mechanisms, how that takes place in the first place, in a later instalment in this series. So now let us explore extroverted intuition in relation to each of these respective codecs, starting first with extroverted intuition and extroverted thinking. Well, the extroverted intuitive dominant here will have a primarily experiential agenda. And therefore, their agenda is not so much towards logic, the completion of goals, the resolution of all perceived values, and indeed, agglomeration of those values, but rather the perpetual experience of novelty, finding new connections opening up constantly. Extroverted thinking here is performing a much more auxiliary role that is being used in order to rationalize the values perceived at the behest of an experiential agenda. The individual using extroverted intuition alongside extroverted thinking is perceiving the vast external world and seeing how all of these different values relate to each other. And variables perceived here are much more dynamic than they are static. And with extroverted thinking here performing a much more supplementary role, of course this individual will be realizing their goals in reality, but oftentimes it is the ongoing concept, the process itself, which takes precedence. However, should extroverted thinking now take the lead, take that pilot seat I referred to earlier, it will now be extroverted intuition backing it up. Well, with extroverted thinking in a dominant position, this individual is no longer trying to constantly shift their macroscopic gaze. Their gaze is remaining much more fixed, and it will remain fixed until all of these macroscopic perceived components have been brought into order. And as such, the agenda here is less experiential and more concerned with the unification of all perceived values. And since this is extroverted thinking we're talking about, in a conversion position, it usually relies upon some degree of manipulation of those values, some degree of interaction with them. However, if you place these pairs into the oppositional position, you know, the oppositional function accompanied with the divergent auxiliary, the dynamic does actually change quite a bit. And we will be exploring that in the next video. With extroverted thinking here in the dominant position, the individual tends to be much more concerned with the acquisition of resources, the maintenance of order, than they are with the pursuit of extroverted intuitive novelty. So now let us pair extroverted intuition with extroverted feeling. Well, if the dominant function here, the pilot, is extroverted intuition, 
then your auxiliary is extroverted feeling and therefore the experiential agenda of extroverted intuition is being supplemented by an extroverted feeling auxiliary function. Here extroverted feeling is being employed in order to enrich the individual's experience. Extroverted feeling order is not being brought and maintained or even enforced here for its own sake, but rather for the sake of the dominant function's agenda, and this agenda is more experiential. And as with the extroverted sensing, extroverted feeling codec lens relationship, extroverted intuition and extroverted feeling with extroverted intuition performing the dominant role tends to have a much more playful approach to extroverted feeling application. However, should this order now be reversed with extroverted feeling in the pilot seat, well, the auxiliary function of extroverted intuition will tend to lock onto a specific portion of the macroscopic landscape until extroverted feeling order has been brought onto it. And with the dominant function now being the codec function, this individual is much more concerned with social order for its own sake, rather than for the sake of enriched extroverted intuitive experience. And what do all of these aforementioned codec lens duos have in common? Well, all of these functions so far have been oriented externally. Therefore, their agenda, what they are perceiving and trying to rationalize upon, is completely external. And while in a later installment in this series, I will be very much exploring how, for example, extroverted thinking can dip down into introverted thinking and how that relationship is actually essential in order to rationalize upon the external in the first place. I am for now, you know, for the sake of simplicity, keeping these codec lens pairings neatly in their boxes. And now that we've explored the extroverted lens codec boxes, let us now turn our attention to the introverted lens codec boxes. Starting with introverted sensing. So first of all, let's take introverted sensing and introverted thinking with introverted sensing here performing the dominant role with introverted thinking being much more supplementary, much more auxiliary to the dominant agenda. Well, this individual, they're using introverted thinking as a supplement in order to enrich their introverted sensing in a world, oftentimes their inner tranquility. And while introverted sensing is, of course, the internal microscope of the cognitive map, this individual's agenda is much more towards shifting perspectives, changing the position of that microscope across their highly compartmentalized introverted thinking circuits. And they do this in order to enrich their internal experience. Many people with this introverted sensing, introverted thinking combination may mistype as an intuitive dominant because they very much resonate with the rich inner landscape, the pursuit of new novelties, of new meaningful connections, but they are doing so in a much more specific way. But let us now say the order of these functions was reversed with introverted thinking now in the pilot seat and introverted sensing performing an auxiliary role. Well, in this case, the introverted sensing microscope is going to be much more locked in on a specific value, very much keeping that value in the person's internal gaze until introverted thinking has brought it into accord. And this is because the agenda here is much more rationalistic than it is experiential. And while, of course, introverted thinking, introverted sensing likes to entertain different perspectives, it'll tend to keep that introverted sensing microscope locked on on that value until it has been fully understood. Imagine, if you will, a conveyor belt in a factory. Well, you have lots of different items on that conveyor belt. But as these items are going along, they tend to lock at point A because point A has the machinery. This is introverted thinking. The machinery does its job and only entertains the next item once that job has been completed. But this is a little bit simplistic because type fluidity very much does exist. So in the case of type fluidity, although I do want to explore this more thoroughly in a later episode, this machine is actually multitasking and taking little bits and components from each of these different items. However, it is still using individual microscopes in order to individually assess each of these items in a very detailed manner. And now let us take introverted sensing and introverted feeling. First of all, with introverted sensing in the driver's seat and introverted feeling performing a much more auxiliary and supplementary role. The agenda here is not so much constant reassessment of values as it is employment of values in order to enhance the tranquility oftentimes of the internal state. But now let us reverse the order of this codec lens relationship with introverted feeling now being in the pilot seat and introverted sensing performing an auxiliary supplementary role to the dominant agenda. Well, this individual is going to be employing the microscope of introverted sensing, but very much keeping it locked on target until it has been brought into a court, until it has been fully subjectively rationalized upon. And this is because as a codec dominant, the agenda here is towards the rationalization of perceived components more than it is a continued novelty or tranquility of an internally perceived experience. 
So now let us move from the microscope that is introverted sensing to the kaleidoscope that is introverted intuition, starting with introverted intuition and introverted thinking. Well, first of all, let us take introverted intuition as a dominant function and introverted thinking performing a much more supplementary role used in order to enhance the novelty or the tranquility of the internal experience. With the dominant function of introverted intuition constantly changing perspective, exploring the entire contents of the introverted intuitive landscape, introverted thinking doesn't necessarily have as much time to lock onto a specific thing. Introverted thinking here is much more supplementary towards the novelty of the internal introverted intuitive experience. The focus here is on new perspectives, new revelations, more than it is a consistent rationalistic agenda. But should we reverse the order of this relationship with introverted thinking now being in the pilot seat and introverted intuition performing a much more supplementary auxiliary role, the focus here is going to be much more innately rationalistic with introverted intuition being very much locked on target, locked on agenda until a specific array of perceived components have been brought into unison. The agenda here is not towards a tranquil inner landscape or a novel internal experience as much as it is the agglomeration, the unification of perceived components. However, with introverted intuition here being much more supplementary and oftentimes having a much more static quality, this particular individual isn't necessarily going to have the all-encompassing attitude of an introverted intuitive dominant and tends to really niche down into a specific introverted intuitive pursuit instead. And finally, let us take introverted intuition and introverted feeling. First taking introverted intuition performing the dominant mole and the auxiliary function of introverted feeling being much more supplementary in nature. With introverted intuition in the pilot seat here, it is the perception of introverted feeling that undergoes the most constant state of flux. The values of introverted feeling do not change as much as the perception of these values. With the lens function here, introverted intuition being in the dominant position, the primary agenda here is the internal perception of novelty or the internal experience of tranquility. However, should introverted feeling take the pilot seat and introverted intuition perform that auxiliary supplementary role, the agenda here is not towards the novelty of the internal experience as much as it is the bringing of order onto the limbic landscape. And as such, introverted intuition is now engaged in a much more static manner with the perspective very much remaining fixed upon a specific portion of the limbic world until those values that are perceived are brought into accord. And as such, introverted intuition is now supplementing a rationalistic agenda, with the rationalistic agenda being much more limbic here than it is cerebral. However, the nature of these particular pairings and the roles they play within any person's respective cognitive map can depend completely upon not only the position they are in within the cognitive map in the first place, but also the levels of consciousness involved. And as such, just as I hope you have used the first video in this series as a supplement towards understanding the contents of this video, I also hope you use this video as a supplement towards the next videos in this series. Because in following episodes, we're going to be using these codec lens pairings to not only explain the dynamic interchange between each and every one of them, but also how the nature of one, say, extroverted intuition and extroverted thinking may change in relation to the nature of another one in a completely different position in a person's cognitive map. And indeed, in the next episode, we're going to be exploring the difference between a codec lens pairing in the dominant position compared to the exact same functions in the same order in the opposing position. And as such, be contrasting the dominant and convergent auxiliary, these convergent functions, with the oppositional and divergent auxiliary, the divergent functions. But in the meantime, should you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to let me know down below in the comments. So that brings us all to the end of the video. So thank you all so much for watching. And if you made it this far, thank you, you are awesome. If you think anyone you know might enjoy the contents of the video or just find it interesting, please do not hesitate to share the video with them. And if you did enjoy the video, please let me know by hitting that like button below. And if you haven't already done so, I highly recommend clicking that subscribe button down below with the bell icon next to it, that way you can stay notified of future content. And of course, a few shout outs before I leave you. CPT ebook, highly recommend checking it out. It explores the fundamentals of CPT. And if you are uncertain about your type or just like to know how it applies more specifically to you as an individual, I highly recommend checking out the CPT type service. 
If you haven't already done so, be sure to click that subscribe button down below with the bell icon next to it, that way you can stay notified of future content. And finally, CPT is on Patreon, so if you're interested in supporting the channel and Ethereum at an additional level, that would be massively, massively appreciated. But of course, it goes without saying, I really appreciate your support over this medium as well. So thank you again so much for watching. It is truly appreciated, and I'll be back in a few days' time. For now, take care of yourself.